guys. How's it going? How's everybody doing today? Pretty good?
guys see that pretty good? And could you, if I drew a, like a little diagram of like shot patterns below that, would you guys be able to see down below here too? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Got that right? Can you see all that stuff? Yeah. Danny, any good steelhead jig sights out there? Steelhead jig sights. Um, I'm not too sure. I guess Voodoo Custom Tackle pretty much has the best uh, the best jigs out there. I would check them out. Voodoo, Voodoo Custom Tackle .com. Um, I'm gonna, you know, you could go on uh, YouTube too and type in jig fishing for steelhead, and there's a couple different. There's you know twitching jigs for steelhead, and then there's also um, you know, floating them under a float. So if you're gonna want to float fishing for steelhead, jig fishing, I know Jim Butler has a lot of information out there too. All right, so I kind of drew a diagram for everybody to see all the different floats and everything I'm gonna pass around so you guys could kind of touch and feel everything and give you guys kind of a situation on when you're gonna use each float and the pros and the cons to each of them and some little little things you could do while you're rigging up your float, your floats and your rods and everything little tricks to switch back and forth from the float so it makes it pretty easy and simple. So I'll pass these around so you guys can kind of touch and feel them so you know what I'm talking about. Wow, bro. And remember too, like, you know, the ones that have like the more wider top surface area, they're gonna move the most, push the most water at the surface. So these are the ones that I'm gonna talk about, the teardrop or the acorn shape. This is kind of a crossbred float between one of those acorn floats and like a Avon stem float, it's kind of a cross breed. So this is basically to fish shallow, fast riffle water, but it also has some stabilization from the longer stem for windy conditions. So that one isn't up here, but that's, I'm gonna pass that one around. But I got a loafer, I got an Avon, I got some acorn and teardrops. 
and I got a big water float, which these are really nice because they're super high visibility. So they're they're also an all around float. So. So these big water floats are kind of like a cross in between like a loafer and one of those acorn shape. And these are really meant for like fishing bigger water where you need more visibility or low light conditions. These are the new blood run floats. They have the really bright orange and they also have a strip of chartreuse. So, you know, 90% of the time you're gonna be using a bright orange float because that's the best to see in high, high light conditions. Like anything that isn't first light or right before dark, you're gonna to wanna to use something that's bright orange. And typically in the past, they've made either chartreuse or orange floats and you kind of picked, you picked and switched up the float. But nowadays the guys got smart and they're starting to make two-tone, different color floats. So you could use the same float in the morning or during the day, so. It's a big water float. All right, so I kind of set a couple different rigs up here. Um, one of the things that's kind of a pain in the butt with float rods is due to the length of them, they could get to be kind of um, cumbersome to carry around and break down and everything like that. Um, rods that are in even sections, two and four piece, tend to be the easiest, and three piece rods tend to be the most difficult because you have an odd section that you're trying to put somewhere. So my preference is a four piece rod because they break down like a two piece. This is a four piece rod here. Um, but if you need to compact it even further, you could break it down to a, a four piece and they, they, only, they only go down to about that long for a 13 footer. So they're great for travel. They're good if you want to keep a backup in the, uh, the back of your car or something like that where no one else can see them. And then kind of to keep it all together in the past, I've kind of was using women's hair scrunchies and now there's these new things called rod huggers that are out. They help keep your rod together without damaging them. They also come with a little tiny hook keeper for the bottom, so if, when you break down your whole setup for the end of the day, you don't have to cut your rig off. You can use the length from the tip of the rod all the way down to the bottom of the handle, and you can move the rod hugger up and down depending on where your hook ends up. And this way you don't have to make much adjustments sliding it up and down. So these rod huggers are the best thing that I have found nowadays that, that hold your rod together. Yeah. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about like different shot patterns and why I choose a shot pattern for fishing different things. And I rigged this one all up, but I think I'm gonna cut it off and pass it around so you guys can kind of see what I did with the silicone tubing on here. And you'll, you'll see why I did that, I'll explain it all. So if you guys notice in all those floats I'm passing around, there's two different styles. There's a stem float with a carbon shaft that takes pretty much a standard size silicone tubing. And then you're gonna have floats that have a wider top to them, like the, the Avons and the, um, the Avons and the Loafers, they have kind of a wider top. So when you wanna use one rod for both floats, what you gotta do is you kinda have to get creative and set up both pieces of tubing on your float and be able to slide the larger tubing you're using for the top of the Avon or the loafer past all the split shot and over top of your hook so you don't have to re-rake. So what I always do is I always end up using two small pieces of tubing that will fit one of the standard stem car carbon floats. And then what I use is two bigger pieces of tubing um, for the, 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 uh, the, the loafers and the Avons. And the reason I always run two pieces of tubing for the top of my float and the bottom of my float like I, I have four in this specific float, but I always want to run two, um, one, for, one for the top here and then a backup one for the top. Because when you're snagged, you're fighting a fish, sometimes a line, this is a pressure point, sometimes you'll rip through that top piece of silicone and it is hard to kind of slide one past all your float and everything like that, or past all your shot and um, the rest of your presentation. So it's better if you just have a backup sitting on the bottom of your float right here. So along with those two things, what I also have is I have two small pieces of clear tubing that I put at the bottom of my float. So I have a back, so I can rig up one of those wire floats or those carbon stem floats um, just by sliding, just by taking off this heavier surgical tubing, sliding it past everything. And now I'm just left with two pieces of tubing um, for those floats there, those stem floats. 
Uh, if you notice too, I always run my last piece of surgical tubing past the bottom stem of the float. So when I'm putting, a, when I'm bulk shotting and I'm putting a lot of split shot right at the bottom of my float, which I always have, no matter where my float is gonna move, the bottom balancing split shot, which is the heaviest point of my line, that is going to move wherever the float is gonna go up and down. So because that's so close to the float, you don't wanna have any rattling going on, you don't wanna damage your float either. But if you're fishing really calm, clear water, or the fish are a little spooky and disturbed, if you have you know, any rattling going on in the surface, a fish could hear it. I mean, that's sometimes, you know, if you're fishing out in the lake for really aggressive fish, you know, rattle traps and stuff like that work, but this is a real stealthy presentation. You're trying to have um, as smooth and calm presentation as possible without any anything unnatural. So everything you're doing is you're trying to make this as natural as possible. So I'll cut this off and pass it around. And I'll do a demo on how I rig up one of the wire floats. Before I start cutting this all up, what I'll do is I'll show you guys kind of, so I had this rigged up with one of my standard jigs here. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the jig. This is one of my classic patterns. It's got an olive head with a, um, I'm sorry, it's got a yellow head, a mustard yellow head with an olive body. And then I have some grizzly hackle in the center of the, of the body of the jig. And that's gonna give me a pulsating action. That's why I add that hackle in there. And then the marabou is gonna give me a swimming action. So a lot of the different things they eat in the lake, some of them pulsate and some of them are gonna swim. So smelt and different emerald shiners are gonna swim and little small freshwater shrimps are gonna pulsate and there's all kinds of other bottom dwelling minnows and stuff that are gonna do different actions. So by adding some pulsating action and some swimming action to your jig, you're covering two different types of bait that they're feeding on. So to rig a jig, pretty much what I do is I still rig it the same exact way that I would rig up an egg sack or a bead or something like that where I'm having the heaviest part of my shot right underneath my float. But I'm gonna, instead of having more weight down towards my barrel swivel, which is my connector in between my main line and my fluorocarbon, um, I'll spread it out over the whole entire thing um, where more weight's at the top here, and it's just spread out thin throughout the whole thing. Because in reality, I could fish this jig with all the weight stacked right underneath the float and just the jig, but that's gonna affect you when you cast. So if you did that, you'd be fighting, this weight would be fighting with this weight, and you get a lot of overlap with the jig laying on top of the float. So casting becomes kind of a problem. If you disperse the weight, and you kind of run it all the way down your line, you want most of the weight to be up near the float because the jig's gonna kinda get down there itself due to the weight of the head. You still wanna spread this all out. That would be like the ideal jig situation right there. So this way, you know, you're, when you're casting out, right before it hits the water, you're gonna slow your reel down and everything should lay down in a nice flat line like this when it hits the water. If you slow your reel down right before, right before the float hits the water, everything should lay down flat. So it's the same kind of idea as when you're casting, what everything is doing in the air versus what everything's doing underwater. The point of least resistance when you stop the float is gonna kick everything out and it's gonna lay it in a nice straight line when you cast. And it's the same thing as when you're drifting under the water. Since the point of least resistance is this last bottom shot here, when you give this pattern or this float resistance, it's gonna keep your going to keep your presentation out in the front like this. The more resistance you put on your float, the more that this bait is going to rise up like this. So you're able to fish with this, I guess this right here is four foot. With this four foot leader, I'm able to fish anything from two all the way down to four foot pretty effectively just by how much I'm trotting my float. So does everybody here, do you guys know what trotting and checking your float is? I kind of went over it yesterday, but does everybody know those terms? Refresher would be good, please. Okay, so Trotting is when you're giving resistance on your reel as your reel is spinning. You're putting your finger against the spool to slow down the float. So you should be doing that at, at all times. You never just want to let your float drift straight up and down at the speed of the current. You always want to slow it down somewhat. In dead ultra like calm frog water, you can get away with it almost being straight up and down, but I still always have the float slightly angled up towards me as it's drifting. This way, I always know the fish is gonna see my presentation before it sees all this split shot in the line too. So, so yeah, like I was saying though, this four foot lead, just by putting pressure, which is called, 
which is called trotting. So as you're, you know, how much pressure you put on your reel will angle your float towards you. So if the current's going this way, you're gonna put pressure on it. And now just by putting the pressure on, you're raising your bait up and down. So the, the slower the hole, pretty much what I'll do is when I walk into a spot, if when I come in, I'm gonna try to read water. And most of the holes that I'm fishing, they're kind of dropping into a fast shallow spot and then they're gonna get deeper and then they're gonna shallow out at the tail end. That's pretty classic steelhead water. When it's the, you know, there's different situations for everything. And, and one of the things that I've kind of noticed is you, you know, these are fish and they're kind of their own thing and you know, they have their own mind and you always want to, you always want to think that in the winter, they're always going to be in the tail outs. That's where they're using the less energy in the slow water. But you go to different places like the Salmon River or you go to the Genesee River or you go out west and they act completely different everywhere. So I kind of thought that I had everything dialed in. I started traveling all over the country about 15 years ago and everywhere I go the fish seem to act a little bit different. Typically here in the Great Lakes in the Erie Tribs the fish will hang out in the slower water the colder it gets. Um, like I said, in the Salmon River, though, is one of these weird situations where they tend to like to hold in really fast water when it's really cold. So um, there's a lot more boats that are coming down those rivers and the rivers I'm fishing, so I don't know if that has something to do with displacing the fish, but that is one thing I noticed there. So like I was kind of talking about earlier, too, um, I kind of rig up my these loafers kind of first and foremost when I'm going into a spot because that's going to be my best all-around float for everything. Um, the, the downside of these loafers are they're pretty tough to see. You only have that little tiny orange dot. So that's one of the things that, you know, once you get, if you don't have really good eyes or the sun's in an odd spot or you don't have a highlight condition, it makes it difficult. What's nice about these is they cut through the water really good. You could jig with them and it's not a lot of top current water displacement. And the fish don't have a lot of, there's not as much surface um, area of the float for the fish to submerge. So even if you have, you know, a an acorn float completely, completely set up perfectly, like a 3.5 gram one, if you have that set up with 3.5 grams a shot exactly how it should be rigged, and you have this eight gram loafer, you know, in theory, they should be both equally amount of tension when the fish grabs it, it should be, they shouldn't feel any tension when that bobber goes down but this is still gonna displace more water and have more tension because it's got a, a larger base to it. So that's why I typically like to go with a loafer, but you're kind of limited in some situations on when you could use a loafer and when you can't. But loafer, the loafer is pretty much what I choose in most of the Great Lakes situations. So now I'm kind of left with a loafer and I have to use a special surgical tubing. So what do I want to do if I'm going to go to like uh, one of those stem floats. What I pretty much do, it's pretty simple. I would uh, typically, I would just cut off my very end presentation if it was a jig. If it was a bead or a nag or something like that, I would just pretty much pull that right off my hook and, and slide that everything down past the hook. But if you're running a jig, you actually have to cut the jig off to do this. I don't recommend using your teeth either. That's, that's something I should be teaching everybody. There's a bunch of good tools out there for it, but. It's kind of habit. All right, so this surgical tubing, I mean, this stuff is, it's specifically made for these floats. I don't know how much different it is than the regular surgical tubing to buy at a hardware store, but this is stuff made by, um, I think it's made by P-Line, this stuff right here. And it's used for, usually it's used for slinky rigs. So I kind of take that, I kind of take that and I kind of convert it over to using for, for float fishing. It works really good. So. So what I'll typically do is I'll slide those bigger, those bigger uh, pieces of silicone tubing right down past all my shot, over my swivel, and down past my hook, or if I cut my jig off, it slides off real nice. So if this was still connected to the rod, I would have had these two pieces of silicone tubing still on my line. They just slipped off really quick. And then I'm left with my little bottom piece that I had that I was using to kind of stop that, that rattling noise I was talking about on the surface. And I'm left with two small little pieces of tubing that now I can run one of these, one of these uh, graphite shafted floats. So typically uh, another little trick that I'll, that I'll do is 
Um, if I want to switch up floats, I tend to run really my largest split shot underneath here to balance it out. I really run big ones and I run softer lead. So typically, you know, a shore shot is kind of the standard in float fishing for what kind of split shot you want to use. You always want to use a round split shot that's not going to create any line twist when you're holding your float back. Because as you're holding your float back, everything is going to want to spin because you're creating resistance in the water. So that's where that barrel swivel helps come into play. And that's where having round or egg shaped split shot come into play too. So the reason I like to run these really big ones up towards the bottom of the float is that they're really easy to take on and off. And I'll typically choose to use something that's a little softer, like a water gremlin right at the top. So water gremlins lead is gonna be a lot softer than a short shot lead, but the short shot tends to say peg longer and you don't have to constantly crimp them down like you would a um, water gremlin split shot. So like here <laughs> in this situation, let's say I was fishing, like I, I would be lucky in this situation because these this loafer matches up with this big water float so I wouldn't have to add or take off any shot to do that. But let's just, let's use this example that I was gonna go down to, let's say that this float weighs, weighed five grams. So all I would typically do is I would rig this guy up. My little backup tubing that I was using, I'm still gonna run it at the bottom of the shaft and not let it go past the piece of graphite. So I got it there, so, it, so when I slide it down to my split shot, What's ending up happening is I'm not getting any rattling noise going on like I've been stressing. And then pretty much what I would do in this situation, if this was a five gram float and I was going from an eight to a five, is I would use a split shot remover tool to take off these two pieces of um, lead up here. Or if they're soft enough, you could sometimes just squeeze them and spread them open with a pair of pliers. So the, tool tool, the two tools that I use the most are a split shot remover tool, which I'll show you guys here. I passed this around yesterday, but for anyone who wasn't here. So this is a split shot remover tool made by Center Pin Angling. They're pretty much the only guys that have them. You got a sharp little blade here, which is really nice for bleeding fish out or you know making a quick cut if you need to. Um, it has scissors at the very bottom, which is nice for trimming silicone tubing, cutting your line, whatever. And then right below there, you have a pair of pliers. So if you you know lose your hemostats or you drop your pliers or forget your pliers for the day, you have an extra pair of pliers. You just have to watch out for the little point that's there to open the split shot. But this is one of two tools that I definitely recommend carrying. Pass it around sharp, so just be careful. The other tool that is probably the most important thing in my whole entire my whole entire arsenal is just a pair of hemostats. But what makes these hemostats different is they have scissors here. And what you guys that have fished row bags before, what you realize is. When you're done with that egg sac and when you want to pull it off, scarving is super hard to pull off and egg sac netting could be really tough too because it's, it's softer and it really sticks on the hook. So this makes it really quick to just trim your egg sac off really quick, egg sac netting off, and put another one on. Or you could just use this just to cut your line if you don't want to use your teeth, which you shouldn't do to begin with. This also has a tiny little point right below it that's used to punch um, paint out of jig head eyes or you know, if you're running flies, sometimes there's some epoxy left in the eye. That's what this little point is here before, and I tend to use that quite a bit. When you buy a new package of jigs, um, or you're tying jig heads, if you don't punch out that little hole when you're tying the jig, you'll typically be left with a little bit of paint. So this little, this little point here really helps clear that paint out. So I'll pass these around for you guys to check out. And the last thing I kinda, I've been forgetting all weekend, and this is one of my other little heroes that that I use quite a bit that I haven't shown off is my hook file. So, you know, I always stress when you're fishing all of these spots, you don't want to leave this hole until you find bottom in each spot. So when you go into a when you go into a run and you start off at the head of the run, I won't start transitioning or moving my float up on this on my rig until I make sure I cover the bottom here. So if I'm fishing here, I'm gonna set up a three-foot leader. And I'm going to constantly be 
checking and trotting my float. So I went over what trotting was. Checking your float is just simply stopping the spool from spinning with your finger and allowing your bait to just rise straight up like this. So what it does is it does two things. It rises your bait so you're covering a lot more different water columns, but it also stalls the bait out in the strike zone for longer. So fish have longer to look at and they come up and grab the bait like 60 to 70 percent of my strikes come on a check. So because I'm so into finding the bottom and I don't want to kind of leave the hole until I find the bottom, I'm, I, my hooks are getting dull quite a bit. So I always want to have a file with me, a small little hook file that I could just sharpen it up so I'm not constantly cutting off hooks because they don't have a sharp point. Um, so like I said, when I would approach this hole, I would start here and I'd pretty much rig three to four foot. And what I would do is I would, as, as my float was drifting down, drifting down, I would be trying to pay attention for, um, for what my float is doing to tell me what's going on at the bottom. So as my float's drifting, this is kind of the ideal situation for as I want my float going down. And I'm watching for it to shoot down like this, which would mean it was a fish. Or if it stands straight up, drops this way and lays down, then you need to just like just lift it off. And then what you're gonna do is rise a bait up and keep it kicking along again. So then you just need to know that when you're trotting, you need to add more tension. So, so what you can do is, what makes this rig so nice is by putting all your split shot on your main line, you're able just to slide the float up and down and adjust the split shot depending on your, the current that you're fishing. And that will get you dialed into exactly, exactly where the fish are and you'll be able to present the bait down to where the fish are sitting. So if I'm going to fish the top of this water here, I'm gonna to need to, it, this is, when I drew this, I pretty much, where the more squiggly lines are, this is where, this is where the faster water is. As it gets, as the line gets straighter, this is where it becomes more smooth. So at the head of the hole, what I'm pretty much gonna do is I'm gonna fish more of my split shot down towards my barrel swivel. Okay, so I'm still gonna do that same taper so the lightest point of my line is closest to my bait. So when I hold back, that's a point of least resistance and the bait leads the way in the water. But um, as I start working my way down the hole, I'm gonna start trying to put, spread more of my weight up my line to give me a more natural presentation, kind of like the same way I would do with the jig, like I was showing you guys earlier. So pretty much as the water becomes, the faster the water, the closer you want your split shot to your barrel swivel, but you always wanna make sure you keep it taper the whole time. And the slower the water, the further away you want your, your split shots to be from your barrel swivel. So that's gonna give you, the more spread out it is, that's gonna give you the most natural presentation. You guys got any questions so far as I'm doing this? Anytime you want to switch to two swivels, one above the float? Never want to do that. Never ever? Nope, because like I was saying, what makes this so effective is let's say you're running, let's say you run, for sake of argument, um, you're running one 12 foot above, and typically guys use an extra swivel in there because they want to hide their low vis, or they want to hide their high vis line. That's why a lot of guys do it. That's the argument to it, or it gets out line twist. What a lot of guys have to remember, number one with the line twist issue, you're not gonna save in that much line twist. I've watched guys use three barrel swivels on their line, and they're not, if they're casting off the side of their reel, it's still, they're still gonna have line twist no matter what. These small little micro swivels that we use in these float fishing rigs are really made for just connections only. Sometimes you'll get a swivel that will have better rotation than another, but these are all, these barrel swivels are just really for a not to not connection, so you don't have to tie two different pieces of line together. So it's a nice clean break point if you get snagged, either at your hook or at your at the top of your swivel below your main line. So that also puts you in another break point. So let's say you have that swivel that's 12 foot above. Number one, if you're fishing in really cold conditions, what I've seen happen a ton of times is guys spend all these money on all this money on rod, on rods and reels and stuff, and they'll reel that swivel through their guides and they'll chew up all the guides all the way down and then they'll have to replace the guides on their rod. So that's one reason I don't like a swivel. And the second reason is because I can't do all this adjustments for all the different types of water. If I have a shot line with all my split shot on it, I can't adjust it, I can't fish this all the way down to, you know, I'm, I can effectively fish this rig 
down to like a foot of water if I wanted to, just by casting down to where the fish are and holding it back and just checking it. I'm able just to present this much line. Or I could fish this same rig in 12 foot of water, 15, 18 foot of water, just by sliding this up and sliding my split shot along with it. Just like so. But um, you always wanna to remember too, when you're sliding your split shot up and down, you wanna make sure that the, the split shot that is the, the one closest to the float is always going to be larger. So you always want it tapering from the biggest split shots near the float all the way down. So that means if you are like not paying attention and you have two small micro shots stick next, stick down next to each other, now you're having kind of, you know, a, a little fighting thing going on with for the point of least resistance under the water. So you have uh, a light spot here and a light spot here, and then you'll have a heavy spot there. So what's gonna be happening is under the water, this point is gonna be trying to drag back while these two are kicking forward. So that's why you always wanna check and make sure that you don't have your two shots sticking together anywhere on your line the whole time. So that's one of the really important things. Um, let's see, anything else I should touch base on? Any other questions you guys have so far? What was the length of the leader from the swivel to the, the jig? I pretty much, I always do arm length is pretty much my standard and the clearer the water, the longer the leader I'll use. So, you know, there's these odd situations where you'll fish the mouths of rivers or, you know, you'll go down to the low end of the yoke where it's really frog water. You know, it's really, really slow down there and you're fishing an eight to 10. I fish some spots in the really low end of oak orchard that are all the way down to 14 foot. And in that situation, when you're fishing this really clear water for pressured fish, a lot of those fish in Oak Orchard I was talking about that I'm fishing for are super duper pressured. So in that situation, what I'll do is I'll tend to run maybe, I know I'm not gonna be fishing anything under, let's say four foot, so I'll pretty much run the longest leader I can um, in fluorocarbon, so I'm not spooking the fish or they can't see it. And then what I'll do is I'll just add a couple extra shot on my fluorocarbon then. So the fluorocarbon, when you pick your fluorocarbon out, there's the really only, the best choice out there right now is blood run. You wanna try to find something that's supple enough that you're gonna get a lot of bait action, but abrasion resistant enough. So as this is cruising down the river and it's ticking bottom or you're fighting a fish and it's bumping you into slate ledges and everything, and it's getting all chewed up that it's not gonna break on you. And you know, if you go, you know, there's kind of a happy medium because if you go too stiff and too abrasion resistant, then it's gonna damper the action of your bait and your bait isn't gonna look natural under the water. So that kind of will differentiate. I've gone all the way up to a six foot leader when the Niagara gets 15 or 20 foot of visibility and I'm like, I'll just add more split shot down there. So the only time I kind of feel like a shot line could be beneficial is in a situation like that where you know you're at least gonna be fishing, let's say five or six feet and above always. I don't think it's a small creek situation. I think it's a large water situation where you're only gonna run, wanna run a small shot line. When I do run small shot lines to get more fluorocarbon presentation, what I'll typically do is I'll typically, I always run you know 10 or 15 pound blood run, 15 way more than 10, but I do run 10 in some circumstances. And that gives me the ability to fish anything from three pound fluorocarbon all the way up to eight pounds safely. So um, what you wanna remember is if you're gonna add a shot line in there, add it somewhere below your bigger shots that are right below your float. So you can still always balance your float out really fast. And usually what I'll typically do is run my ones or my fours on my small little mini shot line. And I will add an extra little swivel in there for a connection. So if I was gonna fish that really clear water situation, I'd add a swivel there, and I have my swivel here to my, my lighter leader line. And what I would typically do is run eight pound leader here, like the heaviest leader that I know I'm not going to break my main line with, and I'll run a lighter leader here. And that, that pretty much, if you're gonna run, that's another point that I wanna bring up too. If you're gonna run tandem rigs, if I was gonna run a bead at the end of this presentation, and I'm gonna do a dropper to a jig or another bead or an egg sack with another hook below that, what I'm gonna to wanna to do is I'm gonna to wanna to make sure I drop that down a liter size too. So typically what I would do is I would run six pound liter and then I would drop it down to five pound liter. So if that very bottom presentation got snagged, I don't lose my top presentation as well. So that's in a tandem rigging situation. 
you guys want me to pass a shot line around and kind of see how it works? Are you guys all familiar with that? You know how it works? You just slide it up and down for your depth adjustment and everything? Good? All right. Anything else you guys want to talk about? You got a question? Are you done with the faults or you can keep going? Or was, uh... I was going to touch a little bit more on that, um, I think. Okay, uh, yeah, finish. I'd like to hear about the reels, uh, faster reels, slower reels, bigger reels, smaller reels. Gotcha, like okay, cool. So um, pretty much just remember when you're fishing all these, in this situation, I don't switch a lot of floats. I either am going to run like a big water series float, like one of those ones I showed you, or I'm going to be running a um, an all-around loafer. Those stem floats like I was talking about, like these Avons, or that acorn float that I showed you with a long stem, that's really for really windy conditions. Because what happens is you have this long rod, you know, 11 to 14 foot rod. And what ends up happening is when the wind blows, it's trying, if you get a really windy day, it's trying to, you know, um, disrupt your drift. So what you have to do is you got to make sure you keep your rod tip down low and use a float that's got a nice long stem on it and not a lot of surface area. If it's got a lot of surface area, it's going to blow around the top of the run. And it's also, uh, if you don't have that long stem, it's not going to stay stabilized. So that's where that float really comes into play. Um, you wouldn't really want to jig with this float here, this teardrop float, because as you're jigging with it, it's displacing a ton of water and it's disrupting the surface area. So that's something you don't want to do. These are specifically made for, fa for fast, shallow water in a situation like this where you're only going to fish three foot. You could pretty much cover the same water with any of these floats just by holding it back. But these that these are popular. I do sell a lot of them and guys typically like them for the, the smaller ditch creeks that you know you're only going up to maybe three or four foot on your deepest spot. Um let's see here, what else can I talk about? Alright, I can kind of go over like the ideal rod for center pin fishing. So I kind of find the sweet spot is 11.6 to 13.6 is kind of the ideal setup for me. And there's a and and when you're looking for a custom rod or you know a rod factory rod right off the shelf, what you're looking for is you're trying to find something that's going to go right to the back end of your elbow. And the reason why you see a lot of these rods in the store that have in the stores that have sliding rings are because you know everybody has different lengths of arms and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, I would try to say a happy medium though is about a 10 inch rear, nine, nine to 10 inch rear grip is gonna get you right to the back of your elbow. So this is a line of rods I designed right here. This is a Colville series rods. I've been working on these for a couple years. And um, when I designed this rod, I pretty much was looking for a rod that was kind of a happy medium between my length and someone taller. So I went with a 10 inch rear grip. And then typically for the foregrip, since I like to put my pointer finger down to kind of stabilize the rod as I'm casting or as I'm drifting, I always try to at least go six inches on the top grip there. So everybody kind of holds their reels different. You can cup your reel like that and not do it. That Without putting that pointer finger up the rod, it kind of makes it feel like I'm going to drop the rod the whole time. So that's why I really like to have my pointer finger on the top of my rod as I'm, as I'm casting or as I'm drifting. And then sometimes I'll kind of come around and put the pointer finger on the side of the cork and I'm controlling the real spool with my pinky finger and then my ring finger. Now all the reels that I make, this is a new reel called a Fjord. Um, this is uh, just brand new for 2017. Uh, they got these really nifty little finger tabs that help in retrieval. They also aid in if your bobber goes down and you set the hook, you got two handles to grab normally. In this situation, as long as you can just slap the reel down somewhere in these finger tabs, you're able to connect a lot quicker. So you're, you're able to get uh, better contact with more fish overall. The other thing about this rod that's really cool is the guide sizes. So when you go to the store and you buy a float rod, um, typically the whole idea is these are these great big giant long rods. So putting bigger guides on the rod will dampen the action and make the rod too soft. The rods that are coming out nowadays are coming out with faster tip sections, so what will end up happening is you don't have to put as much energy on when you're doing the hook set. So that's why faster action is becoming more and more popular. So if you're, if you're holding your arm up here and you have a slower action rod, if 
by the time you set it and you get all the way into the backbone of that rod in, a, in an old school softer noodle rod or float rod, a lot of times the fish are getting off, they're shaking off. With these faster rods, it's a flick of the wrist and you're into the fish. So what you'll notice about this rod specifically is the guides are, they look pretty big towards the end. They're all size eight guides all the way out. So you always wanna make sure when you're, you know, the pro a proper float rod is going to have a guide for a tip top. You're not actually gonna run a normal tip top like you'd see on most fishing rods. You actually are almost gonna have like a, your, the tip of your rod's almost gonna look like it's broken off, but that's actually a huge benefit because there's no resistance as the line is coming out of the guides. It's always going to be the smoothest transition going out. It's not coming out and then cutting in and then going back out where the tip top's getting all the pressure. This way, as, as the line is coming out, it's evenly dispersed on all the guides going out the rod all the way. So also what you wanna kinda of look for on the center pin rods is you wanna to try to make sure that the guides that you're using are sitting really far off the blank. And that serves for two reasons, right? So it's gonna help you have the best transition from your reel to the first guide. There's not gonna be as much friction there. And it's also going to aid with as uh, keeping the line off the blank. Because as you drift, the whole reason we're using high frames is to make sure we're not having any friction as the float is traveling down river. So you don't wanna have your line hitting your rod as it's going down, slowing your float down. You wanna be able to control the speed of your float the whole time. And a big thing, I don't know if I hit it on, on this class yet, but the subsurface current speed is always a lot slower than the surface current speed, so that's why slowing your float down is so important. And in every spot, the, the current might be ripping really, really fast, and there might be some sort of ledge or boulder that the fish are sitting behind, and that's why checking it and trotting it and playing with how fast that spool is spinning is gonna be so effective because you're gonna be able to present it at the current speed where the fish are sitting. Um, so, uh, you know, the other cool thing too um, is on, on all my reels I have a textured rim and the textured rim really is gonna aid in when you're retrieving, when you're batting your reel down, and it's also gonna give you a, a much smoother fight when you're fighting the fish. So when these reels get wet, they typically, a good reel will have a nice big round rim with a lot of surface area, so your finger can really, your fingers can really cover them. The, the rims that just <coughs> drop straight off on a center pin, there isn't that surface area, and it's like, you know, there, there's barely any room for your finger to touch that, that rim right there. So, all the reels I make, they have this nice big rounded rim, and usually I put a texture on it that's gonna be a little bit, um, a little bit more grittier than the, the reel overall. So this way, when it gets wet, your hand isn't slipping on it. You're able to retrieve batting it in nicely without your hand slipping. And when you're fighting a fish, you're not getting like short little bursts of line going out because your finger, the spool is just slipping on your finger. It's just gonna run out nice and smooth. So if you haven't used one, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but when you get used to it, it's hard to go back to anything else. So this, this, uh, this reel, this is a Fjord. All the reels I make, they all have their kind of their own theme, and the whole idea behind the Fjord was I had these finger tabs that look like big mountains to me, and if you guys know what a Fjord is, it's usually where fresh water meets salt water in a big mountainous area somewhere in um, New Zealand or one of those areas. So that that's kind of all the reels are all, you know, I I say they're they're inspired by nature and handcrafted for performance. So every reel kind of has its own theme and it's got its own artwork on the back that's created by a local artist. So everything I try to do locally. The other cool thing too I forgot to kind of talk about on these rods. One of the main things too when you go into a store and you see these Tennessee handles, these sliding rings on rods, the reason they do that is not only so you can put the reel where you want it, like I said, you always kind of want to get it right to the back of your elbow so you have the best leverage on it. If you make it any longer than that, you know, some guys like to keep it in their armpit and stuff when they're drifting. But what ends up happening is when you go to make these big casts, either, you know, over your shoulder or across your body, that handle really gets in the way of you making these big long casts. So it's one of these things I'm really against having a handle much past your elbow. So the other argument is, well, if I want to balance my reel out, if I have a lighter reel, I'm going to want to put it towards the rear end of the rod to balance the rod out better. Well, with the new systems they have and all this rod building industries nowadays, you can actually change the weight of your rod 
just by changing like these little butt weights that I have on all my different rods. So this is a two ounce weight that's gonna balance this 13 foot rod out. These reels are a lot heavier than a standard center pin that are out there. These are about 14, um, 14 ounces versus a typical nine to 11 ounce reel, like one of my Trinities or something like that, or my Paragon. Is there a situation where a heavier reel like the Fjord would be better than yeah, a Yeah, yeah, so, so a, a fast water situation or water that, or an area that there's a lot more current, it, it tends to help a little bit more. And the reason that the heavier spool really aids in the retrieval, number one, and um, it also having a heavier spool will also, it, it basically it takes less once the reel starts spinning, it takes less for the reel to keep going. So even in a slow water situation, if you're fishing slow water, you don't have to play with the reel as much, you know, flicking your finger backwards and forward to get the reel going because once it does get going, it really spins a lot more because it's got more weight to it. So it's more weight, it's harder to slow down. This way you're able, even in, like I said, in a slow water condition, when it's, once you give it a little flick and it starts to go, you just barely touch it and it will be rolling on its own. You're able to control a lot better. So I typically like heavier reels overall. All the reels I design are heavier. Um, this is kind of uh, an East Coast and West Coast crossbreed. Um, it's an inch and a half wide versus my normal inch and a quarter with a lot of the reels you'll see. Some reels you'll even see an inch and an eighth and they're really, really, really slim. I tend to like something that's around an inch and a quarter wide. It seems to be the most comfortable on my hands. But when you're buying a reel, you really want to buy what's comfortable for you. And all these reels are kind of set up differently. This specific reel has a lot more space in between the foot and the spool. So it's kind of like a give or take thing. For somebody that's side casting, it's gonna be a lot nicer because they're gonna be able to cast off the side and you have more room, there's least resistance, you're not gonna hit the foot as much. But someone that's Wallace casting, now you're losing a benefit of having your foot really close to the edge of your spool because now the wind can blow, your, blow the line off the reel a lot easier. Uh, quick question back to shot placement again in high water. What's the recommended shot placement if you're running high fast water? High fast water, so basically high fast water, what I like to do is I always like to stick with my typical, my typical tapered shot pattern. But in high fast water, what I like to do, so I'm always gonna have my heaviest point right at the bottom of my float. Okay, so, so as I'm going down, this is, as I'm gonna go down, what I'm gonna do is instead of having more shot up near my float, I'm gonna start my other shot down here for higher, faster water. So it's still gonna be tapered, but it's gonna get closer to the barrel swivel at this point. So I have, a, basically to answer your question, I have a bigger gap between my balancing shot right below my float, and I also have more shot that's, that's tapered in a shorter area, closer to my barrel swivel. And one of the things I also want to mention too is, um, you know, I'm, I, I really like to put split shot on my leader. And the reason I like to put split shot on my leader so much is because I'm able to cover a lot of different water without making all this adjustment, okay, with all these different shots. So for example, if I come to a hole and it's a little bit slower than, or if I come to a hole that's a little bit faster, if I have two split shots on my Let's say that this is my leader line right here. Okay, if I have two split shots up near my barrel swivel, all I'll do is I'll slide those two split shots down and I'll put them a little closer to the bait. So I'm getting my bait down there a little bit quicker. Plus I have this taper where the closer you put your shot to the barrel swivel, the quicker it's gonna sink. And it's still gonna give your bait that lead that it needs away from everything else. Any other questions guys you wanna know about? I want to see some different different uh, beads or jigs or anything like that. Assortment, anything else, guys? Should I take it a different direction, Greg? Or we can... Yeah, I don't. Do you I think you got going, all the way through the reels? Pretty I keep good going with the reels. I, I'll show you guys. Um, I'll show you guys one of those original reels I was talking about, with where the foot is actually going to be a little bit closer. So this is the original reel I made called the Paragon. I have a reel out now called the Trinity that's gonna be kind of a mix between this reel, the last set of reels I did called the Shadow Drifters, 
and then it's it's, it's got its own little little uh, flair to it, which is a really super strong clicker that's not adjustable. So between the three reels, it's called a Trinity because it's a mix between a three plus a Trinity is an amazing river too. So if you notice, like on that other reel, there was a ton of space in between the foot, the reel foot, which locks onto the reel seat right here, and the, the spool rim. Well, having this, this close of a space in between there, it's gonna give you more resistance when you're side casting off the side of the spool, but you're gonna, but most of the time, guys that have been doing it for a little bit of, for a while, they're mostly Wallace casting. So not having all of that room in there really aids. So most of the time what you're doing is when you're casting, you're coming off the bottom of the reel the whole time, your, your, line, your hand's the guide below it. And when you're casting, you're pretty much, whichever direction the reel is going, your hand's gonna stay right below it to follow. So when I cast, I'm coming two fingers down on the bottom of the line, I'm coming back and I'm pulling down and just casting it and then I'm slowing it down right before the float hits the water. That way I can get that nice straight line that I want laid down with my bait first in the water. So that's kind of the different reel. Now there's some reels, depending on how you're going to cast, there's some reels that have a faster startup than other and there's some that are adjustable. Like if you see on some of the the reels that are out, the lower end reels, they have a tension knob right here on the front, and the tighter you tighten that tension knob down, the slower that spool's gonna spin. Now this will aid in a couple things. If a guy wants to start off and Wallace <laughs> and learn to Wallace cast right away, which is that spinning cast I was showing, he's able to tighten that spool down, almost like a, like a magnet on a bait caster where he's able to get some tension so he's not getting as much bird's nest when he's when he's spinning the reel on a, on a Wallace cast. So on the Trinity, which is pretty cool, is I actually have an adjustable tension that is hidden under my little plate right here. So when a guy orders a reel from out west or something, he's gonna be doing a lot of BC casting where he's gonna be casting a 30 gram float. He's not gonna want that reel to spin as fast as a guy in the Great Lakes because Number one, they're fishing much faster current than we are, bigger rivers, bigger water, and they're also gonna be fishing bigger floats. So they don't need that startup, that, that optimal, um, really easy startup that we're using out here because we're typically fishing you know, a lot smaller and slower water than they are out there. So that's kind of the difference between startups and reels and everything like that. But uh, you know, when you're looking for a reel, I mean, definitely spend the better money on the reel. You really get what you pay for in this industry. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of different reel manufacturers out there, but um, you know, you don't want to buy the cheapest one at first because you really you do get what you pay for in this whole this whole game. So slower water, faster reel, so you get that that start up, and then faster water, or slower reel. Yeah. So you kind of more in control, but that. From a casting perspective though, I mean, you're gonna have two different experiences there as well, right? Yes, yeah, you will. So um, pretty much the heavier spool reel, like this Fjord here, it's the same kind of thing. Like when when it gets going, it really goes. So you're gonna able, you're able to get a further cast with a heavier spool versus a lighter spool. Cause once you pull down and you, if you're assuming we're doing a BC cast or a Wallace cast, and for the guys that don't know what a BC cast is, it's the same exact thing as like you would cast a bait caster, you're loading the rod and you're just using one hand. So you're back, you're waiting for your reel to spin and you're timing it and just coming forward and throwing it out there. And the heavier the reel, since it's spinning, it's actually kicking the line out for you. You don't have to load the rod as much as you would if you were gonna side cast or something like that because the reel is actually doing it for you. But the whole thing is you're getting that momentum because like I described in my video that I did yesterday on the casting and all my YouTube videos, you really want to create that pendulum where you have a big long lead from the tip of your rod down to your float. You want to at least have seven or eight feet so you're able to swing that, gain the momentum, come back and come forward and pull down. Now when you're casting like a Wallace cast or whatever, the heavier the spool, the more line it's going to throw out because it's more, it's heavier, it's like a wheel, it's just heavier line or, or heavier uh, overall weight is throwing that line out there for you. So you got to actually do a lot more work to cast a lighter reel. So if you felt, uh, you know, a cheaper Okuma that there isn't much to it, you, number one, you'd have a hard time balancing your rod and number two, um, you'd have to do a lot more work to cast that the same distance. That's the other thing. 
And you also talk about stainless steel bearings versus ceramic bearings in your reel and the way that the hubs are set up where the bearings sit. Uh, the, I'm a big fan of ceramic bearings, okay? These reels are always gonna be smooth. They're always gonna start up really easy to, no matter what bearing you use. But the only difference is you're gonna get some feel in your reel when you go to ceramic bearings. And the feel is nice because when you're doing these big monster casts where your reel's spinning really fast, you're able to have all of that feel in your hand where you're able to slow, kind of almost know when to slow down the reel if it's getting to go, if it's going too fast, you're, you're, you're able to slow it down, you're feeling it in your hand. And when you're drifting, I could drift blindfold just by feeling it when I'm fishing a um, uh, reel with ceramics in it because I'm getting feedback. It's just, it's almost like a light purr that you get when you fish ceramics in a reel. So I'm, I'm much more into fishing ceramic bearings than I am regular um, stainless steel bearings. And they also will hold up better over time, the ceramic bearings. Uh, the only downfall to the ceramics that I know of is that if you drop your reel, they tend to chip and shatter a little bit more than the stainless steel, but they work better in colder conditions. They displace heat more and they typically have a better startup. And, um, and you also get that great feel that I was talking about. You guys got any other questions? Uh, real, real diameter. Real diameter. Okay, that yeah, that's a great thing I want to bring up. So, you know, nowadays it seemed like you know when I first when I first got into it, it was like all that was available were four inch reels up to four and a half inch reels, and you know they had a wider spool to hold more line. Nowadays I'm seeing you know it's like big the bigger the reel the better. It's starting to get more you know more and more and more you know larger diameter reels. I've come out with one called the Leviathan, which was the first five and a half inch reel on the market. And then from there, I've come, I've come out with some five and a half inch Trinities. So what you're gaining in a bigger reel, since this is a one-to-one -one gear ratio, you're able to pick up a lot more line with a, with a wider, or I'm sorry, with a larger diameter reel versus a smaller diameter reel. But I don't like to really go anything less than five inches. Five inches is comfortable. It's gonna give you that weight you need. And it's also gonna give you the line pickup you need. A five inch diameter reel is kind of the standard in today's float fishing. Although most of the larger companies out there, they're still putting those four and a half inch ones out to kinda, because they probably already have the program set up, it's still cheap and easy for them to make. But you'll see a lot of the reel manufacturers now are making five inch plus because of that, all the extra line pickup. And I had a bunch of friends out west that had high speed <coughs> bait casters next to five and a half inch diameter reels and the guys with the five and a half inch diameter reels were able to get in that cast or get in that drift faster and make another cast before a high speed bait caster. So that's where the diameter kind of comes into play. It also comes into play if you need more line, if you're fishing somewhere like Oregon or Washington or you know, BC or something like that as well. Could you talk specifically about the importance of matching your leader breaking strength with your main line strength and when you want it to break and and also how that plays into rod weight too you see a lot of rod weights and yep <coughs> so I'll go back to I'll go back to my rod here so this is my um, my Colville three power okay now this rod is rated this is my three power um, and it's rated five to twelve pound now the five to twelve pound that's mostly that's, that's just talking mostly about leader. So when you see five to 12 pound, that's, that's telling you you can run up to a 12 pound leader on this safely without, without risking damaging the rod. But if I wanted to run 20 pound mainline on this, I can do that, but I just, I just have to make sure I stay under 12 pound to protect the integrity of the rod as far as leader goes. So always, like I was saying earlier, you always wanna make sure you run a much, uh, a much lighter piece of fluorocarbon for a leader than a main line. Um, and I typically like to run the 15, one of the reasons I like the 15 pound over the 10 pound so much is I'm able to run a whole different array of leaders. Once I get to 10, what ends up happening is if you run an eight pound below the 10, if everything's perfect and you're snagged, you should break the eight <coughs> over the 10 all the time. But um, if you pinch a shot too hard or you slide a shot and phrase a line, you're getting too close between that eight and 10 pound diameter. The 15 gives you a lot more bumper in that, in that end of things. 
So I also want to tell you guys too to make sure that you try to buy the exact same leader as the line. Like I like to run the blood run line so much because it's a floating mono or it's just a subsurface mono that when I'm drifting and my bobber sinks, I don't have a whole bunch of line that's somewhere submerged in the water that I gotta lift all that line out of the water and then come into contact with a fish. If it's just sitting there on top of the water, just below the surface, when that float goes down and I set the hook, I'm right on the fish. I don't have to make as hard of a hook set at that point. And do line and leaders are all over the board between different manufacturers? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So like I was saying, you know, I go with the 15 pound blood run, I can run 10 pound to three pound effectively. But if you did something like you bought a, uh, a Sunline Siglon F eight pound, and then you brought a Drennan six pound, you'd be breaking left and right all the time like crazy. That's why I really suggest to stick with the same line manufacturers, some line manu line to leader manufacturer. So buy the same brand. So if you're gonna run Blood Run, make sure you run Blood Run Leader. It's really it'll make your life a lot easier. But if you're not going to, if you're kind of in this situation where you know, you run out a liter out on a trip somewhere and you need to just stop in, you know, a Dick's or a, you know, Kmart, a non-specialty store and you need to buy fluorocarbon, make sure you try to buy something that is a lot less diameter than your main line. So kind of know what the diameter of your main line is before you go. And then make sure when you buy your fluorocarbon, you're buying it um, a couple thousand smaller. So for example, if the, if the 15 pound I'm running is 0.013, inch diameter, what I'm going to want is to at least go, you know, a zero uh, or a point zero zero nine inch diameter for my, my leader line. Does that kind of answer that question? Okay. Any other questions you guys have? Question about slip floats. Yep. How long the shot line, because you typically have to offset the top of your float with a few big slip shots. Correct. How Correct. long is the uh, shot line that you're using for uh, a slip float, say if you're fishing 15? So typically my little trick with a slip float is I always like to run a bobber stop below the slip float and a bobber and two bobber stops above the slip float. So if at any time I want to make that a fixed float and get that really nice presentation that you're going to get with a fixed float over a slip float, um, I have that uh, I have that option. Okay, but that's if that's if I slide my float down pretty close to where the heaviest point of my line is on my slip float. Uh, so, um, with the with the slip float with my shot line, I like to make sure between my where my bait presentation is to my shot line, I'm going to always be fishing at least that depth deep. If that makes sense to you. So if I'm fishing the Niagara River, when I rig up my slip float for the Niagara River, I always am going to be fishing at least six to eight foot deep at all times. I'm never going to fish anything lower than six foot. So I know that that whole presentation from where I'm gonna start my shot line to where it's gonna finish is always gonna be six foot. So if I wanna really present a really natural presentation in the six foot area, I could slide that down and now make my slip float a fixed float just by running bobber stops below and above the float. So I still get that natural drop out um, where the bait really leads the way. But if I have to fish you know, a 20 foot hole, what I'll do is I'll keep that bobber stop close down by where the sinkers are and I'll slide slide the two bobber stops up 20 feet and I'll make that cast. What you have to do is you have to make sure you try to, you know, instead of casting, kind of quarter casting it down, you kind of more want to cast straight out from you so you have more time for your bait to come down and that all that weight to settle down and then your tapered shot line to do what it does, which is to present the bait first. You want to kind of cast straight out instead of quarter casting below you towards the fish. Does that answer the question? It does. Okay. And do you ever use slinkies instead of the whole shot line? Yeah, I actually do. I was kind of I was kind of um, doing a demo yesterday about how I skein fish, and the slinky really comes into play when you need to get a big chunk of bait down there. So if you're salmon fishing and you need to fish with uh, you need to fish with a big blob of skein that's going to ride really high in the water because it pushes so much water. Um, and salmon typically like to sit in really swirly areas with upwellings, totally different than steelhead water. What I'll do is I'll typically run a slip float with whatever that slip float is. If it's a one ounce slip float, that slinky will be one ounce to balance the float out. And then I'll typically run like a four foot liter off of that. So what's happening is I'm pretty much just able to almost like 
bottom bounce with that slip float. So I'm able to kind of pull the line through it, but at the same time, that weight's stabilizing the bait and the bait's kind of out here. I found it more effective to do the shot line method with the inline trolling sinker though, rather than that slinky rig. But the slinky rig does work really good under the float too. Do you have to use a shot line with the slip float? No, you don't need to. I, I, I prefer it just, it makes it a little bit easier for me, but you don't need to, no. You could run all your, you could run all your split shot on your main line. So if you're steelhead fishing, and you want to do that that presentation where you're putting a bobber stop below and above and you want to still be able to slide all your split shot up and down your line to give that really natural presentation you could put all your split shot on your main line just like you would do one of these fixed float rigs um, and then you would just have your normal leader and then what you would do is you would uh, just you know once you got to the point where you couldn't cast uh, that depth, whatever that sweet spot is, like my cutoff's around 15 foot when I have to start using a slip float, that's when that's gonna matter. So what I'll do is I'll typically slide all my shot down to like a five or six foot leader, and that's what I'll be casting off of. So if I'm fishing 20 foot down, all of my presentation's within five or six foot, but I'm able to get the most distance out of a five or six foot area. So if all my split shot is on my, on my main line in a slip float rig, that's how I'll do it. Any other questions, guys? Different baits, you wanna see some different jigs, different jigs for different purposes or something like that. Um, so, uh, you know, they always say that, they always say that in the, you know, in, in the darker the water, the more, sh the, the darker jigs and the darker color egg sacs and the brighter egg sacs you wanna use, it casts more of a shadow in the darker water. And I kind of find that, you know, depending on the areas you're fishing and what waterways you're fishing, whatever is the most natural in the Great Lakes of what the fish are used to feeding on or what they haven't already seen, that's gonna be what the fish are typically gonna bite. So. Um, you know, these fish that are coming out of the Erie tributaries are mostly eating emerald shiners majority of the time. And so what I found is one of the top jig, jig choices that I use is I'll typically use a white marabou jig. That's gonna give me, and I'm gonna make it look just like a emerald shiner. During spawning season, when the steelhead starts spawning, what I'll do is I'll implement a little pink in the head of that jig or I'll use like a yellow head and that's gonna give that impression of almost like the same thing as an egg sucking leech, but now you're getting an egg sucking minnow. So that's gonna not only, you know, the fish is gonna see a food source, which is the emerald shiner, but now it's seeing a minnow that's eating an egg and they're gonna strike on it because they wanna kill that, they wanna kill that um, bait that's eating their, uh, eating their eggs. So um, I always like to make sure I use scent and, uh, and then pretty much from there, I would just try to, uh, um, you know, I'd start off with a white jig and then I'd go to a black jig and then an olive and I'd kind of try to find something that they would want and then, then I'd go to a different, something like a bead or an egg sack or something like that. I think I might, I'm out of time, guys. Any more last, last minute questions before I get out of here? You guys got it all covered? Cool, man. Thank you for coming. I hope it was educational Thank for everybody you. and everything. Thanks, man. If you want to check out, I got all the Blood Run leader in line at my booth and everything. If you want to look at any of the up close rigs, I got it all. But thanks so much for following.